welcome to the Farm Beats podcast. Farm Bits is proudly produced by the Nebraska Digital Agriculture Team and hosted by students at the University of Nebraska. The Farm Beats podcast comes to you each week to discuss the trends, the realities, and the value of digital agriculture. Through interviews with experts, producers, and innovators from across the agriculture industry, we hope that you step away from each episode with new practical knowledge of digital agriculture technology. Hello, Farm Beats followers, and welcome to another episode of the Farm Beats podcast. I'm Jose Cesario. And I'm Taylor Cross, and we are glad to have you with us as we continue to learn and connect more with Nebraska's extension resources and research efforts. On this episode, we welcome Guillermo Balboa, a research assistant professor at UNL, to discuss his involvement in digital ag, crop modeling, and Nebraska extension. He brings an extensive background to the Farm Bits podcast with past experience in three different countries. With that, let's jump into this episode with Guillermo Balboa. Uh, so about myself, uh, I grew up in Argentina. Uh, so I'm an agronomist, agronomic engineer. Uh, I studied in the University of Rio Cuarto in Cordoba, it's a province in the center of the country. And I was working at the beginning of my career with uh, crop production and uh, doing some teaching. Then I moved to the U.S. for a Ph.D. in cropping systems in Kansas State University, um, working yeah, basically in how to close yield gaps uh, in corn and soybean rotations uh, with Dr. Ciampiri there. And then after that, I did a, a postdoc in Australia working for CSIRO. There's a research agency from the Australian government. Uh, working uh, broader projects, uh, focusing on farming system, not only one or two crops, but we have eight crops in different rotations to try to see which, how we can be more efficient per millimeter of water that is coming into those systems. And also focusing there uh, in a project on digital ag. So they bought a, a new farm and we're putting together the starting project uh, for that farm. So after that, I moved back to Argentina. Uh, we developed there. I was doing as a, acting as a research assistant professor at University of Rio Cuarto, uh, basically in cropping system, uh, doing teaching in at the graduate and undergraduate level. And we also developed there a program in precision agriculture that was launched in 2021 and before I started my position last year. So I started here in September last year uh, with Dr. Puntel's uh, lab, focusing on, on precision agriculture and, and cropping system modeling. Uh, so and participate in a couple of projects uh, related to how to we can better manage uh, water and nitrogen in corn uh, fields and also uh, looking at the rotation with soybeans. And we're also participating in other uh, projects that we let you know <laughs> through the interview so you can ask some questions. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Thanks for that background. You have quite the quite the experience. And so for those that might not be familiar, um, you are a research assistant professor. So what does that look like for you day to day? Um, your involvement with extension? Do you have involvement within the classroom or um, just research projects? If you want to give us a little overview of that, that'd be great. Yes, my main appointment as a research assistant professor, the position is 100% research, but I also participate uh, in some extension uh, activities that we have going on within the group. Uh, as you know, uh, Dr. Punta has an extension appointment. Uh, Laura Thompson is also part of the team as a coordinator of the on-farm research uh, project that you interviewed her a couple of podcasts uh, ago. So. Uh, so basically, the main focus is conducting research uh, and research on topics uh, like I mentioned before, cropping systems, uh, applying all the modeling tools in order to uh, have a better understanding of how different management practices, uh, focusing specifically now in nitrogen management and water management uh, in corn fields can, uh, can be improved in order to increase yields and have more sustainability, yes. That's amazing, Dr. Balboa. And it seems that there are a lot of going on uh, while you go this uh, doing this research. So would you mind to describe a little bit about the field experiments that you have going on right now? Uh, yeah, sure. So the, uh, the main field experiments that we have uh, going on, specifically for the ones that I'm focusing, uh, as I mentioned before, we are, we are testing different nitrogen levels and irrigation levels and how they interact uh, in, in, with, in corn production. So we have one of the main fields in uh, SCAL. Uh, the research station for the university. And it's a high, uh, it's intensely 
uh, we have a, a intensive data collection in that field. So we we, we do uh, every other week, uh, we measure biomass, left in the different parameters of the crops that we can use after uh, to put into modeling and to try to represent that what happened in that field. And then from that, and once we calibrate a model, we can start running different simulations in order to understand, better understand how we can manage in nitrogen uh, and, and water. And one of the things that we're measuring now, and, and I'm pretty excited because we were taking a look yesterday to the root data. It's not easy to collect those samples and we just got uh, uh, all the analysis from last year uh, and the last two seasons. And we're seeing some responses on the treatments that are very interesting and how uh, roots are going deeper in the cases that you are not having irrigation or more shallow roots in the case that you have irrigation and also differences within the nitrogen rates. So when you have more uh, nitrogen, uh, let's say compare the high nitrogen with the no nitrogen, the distribution of those roots were different uh, within the profile, not only the depth, but also they were concentrating in upper layers in one case and in deeper layers in that one. So these things are very interesting and and those are interesting results uh, that we can get into modeling to, to get more inside of that. Yeah. How can um, those <clears throat> data sets that you're collecting, um, how are you using those in your crop, like filling those gaps in the crop modeling? And I guess before we get, answer that question, if you just want to talk a little bit about like what crop modeling is, maybe for those listeners who aren't familiar yeah, that, that's, uh, thank you for, for asking the question. So a crop model basically is a representation of a system, in this case, a crop, but can be a soil model, water model, whatever. In this case, we are using APSIM, that is uh, an Australian model that is, uh, is free uh, to use uh, for research and purposes. So basically what we do in, in that, you have what, what is interesting about this model that has been used uh, in, here in the US for quite a long is that it's very kind of easy to set up for a, a, even a, an agronomist. Um, and you have different models like the crop, the soil, the weather parameters. So it's, it's, once you set up those uh, different parameters, then you can start uh, running different simulations and comparing what the model is saying what, with what we measure. And then we try to do some calibrations in order for them to match. So once you calibrate the model, you can start running those models in different situations and you can basically uh, predict uh, or having results of research without actually conducting the research in let's say 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, so we can, I always say that we can give more value to the data that we all collect every day because every team, they collect a lot, tons of data throughout the years. And sometimes in new projects, we don't need to start collecting new data, but to take a look to the data that was already there and try to use these tools like crop models in this case that can be can help us to get more value out of that data and to see things that if you just take a look to one data set, you will never be able to see. But if you combine my data sets, your data sets, and in fact, we are collaborating and cooperating with our research teams, let's say for the, the irrigation uh, team, uh, so they are conducting their own experiments and we are measuring some parameters in those experiments in order to be able to use that data too. So it's just a way to, that you can kind of give more value to, uh, to data. And the basic outputs that you get from those models are going from yield, that is what, of course, farmers are interested in, mm -hmm. but also we get a lot of other things like the total biomass or how much of that total biomass was going to grain. Uh, what about the nitrogen concentration of those grains? What about how much nitrogen was left in the profile? And we also keep track of those variables because it's, it's very important to better adjust, uh, let's say, uh, nitrogen rates. So just to close the, the, the model section, I mean, uh, farmers can find this cut quite difficult sometimes, but there are some models out there today that can help them to make uh, decisions, let's say on nitrogen management, like granular or adaptin, and we're also testing those models. And if they basically, what they are seeing or what they are doing in those models is, is pretty similar to what we do, uh, but we are kind of one step behind that, uh, making sure that all those parameters that they need to select are being calibrated before, or they are or they are kind of have the right options in order to make a decision. So. These models that we are mentioning that we're working in research, at some point they will they can be translated 
into models that farmers are using. So it's not something that is theoretical or just focus on research. In fact, in you know when I was in Australia, all our wheat experiments were the nudging application was managed with this uh, model that they have a commercial version there that is basically the model running into a website. So farmers can log in and, and check uh, with the wear data, the soil that they uploaded and everything. And uh, you can get more estimations on yields, but also on nitrogen rates. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for that um, overview of um, that process. Yeah, that's us. that's really interesting, Dr. Babo. And it's nice to see how these tools can help the farmers to make decisions on extension, on, on the research sides of things. So, and uh, you mentioned about the crop modeling, but we also seen that you have another keyword associated with your name, such as cropping system, nutrient management, and also digital ag. Can you explain to us how this worked for you and what are your experience in the other keywords that we mentioned now? Uh, going into your question about uh, the keywords on my profile, yes. So you mentioned some of them. I think I, I talk... Uh, from most of them, but uh, you mentioned maybe digital agriculture that is kind of uh, the last addition to, to my profile. <laughs> but uh, it's funny because uh, I always have, a, a, since I started my career, uh, like a tech side, and I was focusing on how we can, uh, <clears throat> not even in research, but also in production, how we can incorporate different technologies that can uh, basically save us some time and help us to make better decisions. I think that today, uh, farmers, researchers, everyone is is overwhelmed by the big amount of applications for phones or, or different technologies that they can uh, use in order to improve <clears throat> their facilities or their, their management. And I always was asked, asked back to Argentina and sometimes when uh, in Australia and here, what is the best application let's say to measure something or the best model to diagnose nitrogen so and, and i also say that there is nothing that is the best for everyone that it, every tool needs to fit uh, your requirements so if you are let's say talking about nitrogen applying one single rate of nitrogen to your whole field so that's your your step one today <clears throat> so your next layer might be start looking into different tools that allows you to watch, to take a look to that variability that you have within the field. And then you have many options there and you can start testing some of those and you can even contact the extension program from UNL and start testing those. Uh, and let's say some of the farmers, maybe they, they already take a, took a look to that and they have management zones within the field and they, they know that this area and they have a shape file or a, or a map saying that this area is yielding more than this other area. And they want to go deeper on that, and they we can we can talk about other set of tools. So then the recommendation for each farmer will be different, I think, uh, and and we don't need to lost like what is your objective for each specific farmer. And and the last thing I will say is all these technologies, they have been around some of them for quite a bit of time, and we are seeing that some of them might be like we should be seeing more level of adoption. And sometimes uh, um, we're seeing that the restriction or the barrier for adoption is that sometimes they don't see the actual value of applying a specific technology. And I, I will not name anyone, but um, so we conducted uh, last year a, a review in all Latin America, uh, focusing on digital agriculture, uh, trying to put together a list of uh, which were the technologies that were most used in Latin America and which ones were the barriers for adoption. We did a review and we conducted uh, around 40 interviews in Brazil, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, just to have a, an overview of that. <clears throat> and we are presenting that, in fact, next week in the International Precision Act uh, Conference uh, in Minneapolis. Um, and it was interesting to see that uh, when we were asking them, which technology are you using? They mentioned a long list, but sometimes we ask them, so how are you? benchmarking or, or taking a look to the bene specific benefit of, let's say, the use of the GPS uh, technology in the sprayers. And they were, they were kind of, there was a silence in the, in the <laughs> interview to say, oh, well, we are doing better. We are saving time. They were not quite sure or they were not able in most time, most of the cases to provide an example. Um, so in that review paper, we also took a look to 
different indicators that they can start using in order to 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 provide a, a number saying I'm being more efficient because I apply 20% less fertilizer or my nitrogen use efficiency improving X percent. So whatever we're doing, even in basic economical research, any extension project or anything, and uh, this kind of a, a message that they always have, we need to be able to quantify the impact of what we are doing uh, because we can be convinced of what we are doing, but we need to show that as a scientist, mm -hmm. uh, with numbers and to prove that those results are 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 improving something the system or not and if we are able to make the farmers start using this uh, approach of measuring things they measure a lot of things mm -hmm. uh, so they can start taking a look to this too yeah that's really important to be able to quantify you know those benefits um kind of piggybacking off of that statement um are you taking any of that uh like interview um kind of uh, assessment from i think you said that was in latin america or uh how are how are you um or are you transferring that here to nebraska farmers and encouraging their use of digital agriculture and agriculture technology mm -hmm. yeah that's a great question so we have the idea that there's not an actual uh, I, uh, as far as i know uh, survey and that we are planning there are some specific surveys some some specific technologies um there are some assessment at a u.s level mm -hmm. let's say uh, some of them uh, prison like magazines they conduct our annual review on that and what i was i would like to point out about that is some of the uh, limitations for adoption are quite similar in all the countries that i visit and work with mm -hmm. precision ag and that's that's quite interesting because when I was in Argentina, I, I was thinking, oh, in the U.S., they 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 really manage uh, yield maps. They have clear thought about how to do a management zone and a lot of things that we were assuming. Uh, and when I first arrived in 2014 to Kansas, I was aware, I was surprised that yeah that we have kind of the same level of problems. So let's say how to open a yield map, how to clean the yield map, how to make uh, process in different layers of yield maps, or or now that let's say that satellite imagery is freely available. So I, I was uh, surprised about that. So that's called my attention. Uh, I do think that uh, in Nebraska, I mean, uh, especially with the on-farm research network, uh, a lot of these uh, barriers, uh, I think we are tackling some of them. If you get into UNL extension website, you can see a lot of tools, like you have digital courses to know how to clean a yield map. You have some statistical tools that farmers can do basic experiment. They can analyze and see if they were they were different or not. You have this podcast series that also interview people. <laughs> and, and yeah, I mean, it's I, I don't want to be, but it's, it's true. I mean, you are giving information. And queries is is if we make if we can make people think about these things, I think that is, is something positive too. I mean, it's and all the research, of course, uh, there's, there's a lot of research going on, but also sometimes there's a, a uh, transferring that research into a uh, useful tool is, is also a challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. So in one of the projects that we're involved is called the, the Dawn Project. It's basically developing a dashboard uh, with different tools that farmers can use uh, to, to support their decision making related to water and nitrogen mainly. This is uh, a five-year project uh, funded by USDA. We have uh, more than 25 researchers from five different universities. Um, so some of the tools that we are developing there, so let's say there is a tool that is a crop uh, growth develop tool that basically you can select a specific uh, location of your field. You can give the planting date and the maturity group or growing degree day of your corn, and it will allow you to predict uh, with a big database and machine learning behind and key phenological stages uh, that you farmers used to make different management decisions. And there are some tools out there already about that, but this tool is kind of more supposed to be most precise because uh, use some new techniques on data analysis to make those decisions. There are some tools coming soon about yield forecasting in this project. So people will be able to uh, select a field in, in different areas of the corn belt and and have an estimation in advance of the yields. There is another tool that is coming too about the irrigation that UNL is leading that um, uh, with Dr. Neil um, from the Water for Food Institute. So mm -hmm. that's quite interesting. That tool is being incorporated in this dashboard. The idea is to uh, start releasing these tools uh, as soon as they are ready. 
we are in the in the phase of testing them. And they will be freely av freely available uh, in a website from the project. So that I think that's something uh, interesting for farmers. Yeah. yeah, for sure. That's a really neat idea. Yeah, no, that's that's for sure a great idea. And you, you mentioned uh, some of the countries that you you've been working, like Australia, Argentina, and of course here in US. And can you tell us a little bit more what are the main differences in terms of extension and, and few technology implementation that you see in these countries? Yeah, sure. From the extension side, I will say that I, will, I can talk more about Argentina and the US. In, in Australia, I was more focused into research. Uh, uh, although we, we have the research institute that I was working in Australia, um, so the the theme of the institute is solving Australian problems. So they, they were really focused on, uh, let's say one time a company that uh, was managing around 150 Southern acres, uh, assessing farmers who were coming with uh, questions if they were doing a correct analysis of the uh, yield maps. So we just uh, conducted a, a study to see how they were doing and we proposed new tools for them so that they, they they work a lot, a lot on demand and these kind of uh, witness cases, so they can show these, the, the results of these to the rest of the of the companies. It's not working in one to one, but at, at the end they they spread this around the area. Uh, and I will say that uh, the technological level of our farmers, and I will start from that, in Australia, the US, and Argentina is 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 quite similar. Uh, of course, it might be leading by. Australia and the US, but Argentina and Brazil, I will say they have a very well developed uh, agricultural industry. And uh, you know that because a lot of farmers visit Argentina and they are surprised about the size of the farms, how they manage all the spraying, this, the, the planting and everything. So visiting, being living in all these three countries, I can say that the technology is pretty similar and pretty much whatever is coming out here in Australia, maybe in the same season or at the same time is being tested in those countries. So, and then uh, focusing on the extension side is, is, is very different. And I think the US has this wonderful system that you have a, a, a quite a big group of people working in extension. You have extension agents in each of the counties and they focus on not only in production, but also in economic uh, results and also in, in social aspects of production and everything. Uh, so we don't have that level of investment from the universities in Argentina. We do have some extension, uh, pro we have extension programs in all of them, but pretty much all the extension depends on the professor that is conducting the research. And maybe other institutes like the USDA here, that would be, let's say, INTA um, or EMBRAPA in Brazil. And they will be focusing more in, in, in more deep research and also have more extension a broad extension program. Let's say they have research stations. Um, so let's say a combination of those institutions with university will be similar to what it is in the US. But there is also a strong kind of extension component there that is being pushed by companies <coughs> because they want to introduce some technologies. So they are investing in universities and research centers in order to test different technologies. Something similar, uh, but here is more kind of they work together. Yeah. That's really cool. So what uh, point did you kind of, what or what made you interested in ag technology and digital ag to make you want to follow this path into becoming, um, into the position that you're in today at research assistant professor here at UNL? Oh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting <laughs> question. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, given my, my background, uh, as I mentioned before, I started with couple of crops and cropping systems, farming systems, and then incorporating uh, first what is called the, the precision ag and then digital ag. And I would like to make a comment there because maybe farmers or people is hearing digital ag, precision ag, and they might be thinking, is this the same? What is the difference? So let's do some <laughs> some <laughs> clarification there. And uh, we, we... Yeah, that'd be great. This Thank is you. <laughs> this is important too, because when we conducted this research, uh, Digital ag is a word that is out there a lot in nowadays, and a lot, when we were asking how to define that, people also were struggling. So basically, digital ag is all those uh, tools that we can uh, put into action today in order to improve uh, food production. And it's, only, it's not only affecting the farmer level, but all every member in the, in the value chain, let's say the 
elevators, the companies, the, the industries. So it's kind of uh, integrating all the, the value chain. And, and also, let's say that one, and Digital Ag is like a big umbrella, and you can find one of the biggest branches of Digital Ag is precision agriculture. So let's say precision Ag will involve any a tool that is able to generate uh, data, uh, information tied to a GPS point location, let's say in, in big words. Uh, but there is a lot of technologies that are in, not included in that. They don't include like that uh, novelty of the location, let's say a, a phone application, a software, a model, a new technique to analyze data or new techniques to transfer data from the field in real time uh, to the farmers operations so they can see in real time how much the crops are yields. All these platforms, all these new tools, uh, all the I, what is called the IoT, all the sensors that can be directly connected to the internet and sensing information for the farmers to take better decisions. So all those tools are incorporated in what we call digital ag. So it's kind of, when we call about digital ag, it's kind of we are in, involved in all of those technologies or a group of things. And precision ag, yes, is, is a, a term that we use just to focus on and what I mentioned before, but yes, this lag is kind of more a broad topic and it's a hot topic in the last four or five years. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for making this clear for us, Guillermo. And talking about like all these tools that we have available nowadays, what's something that you are looking forward in the future of this digital egg and precision egg? Yes, as I mentioned before, I think that uh, it will be good if in the next, let's say, 10 years, uh, we are really um because i think we we have a, a a good enough number of technologies and i think that more technology is coming and 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 we cannot stop that and they will become newer and newer and or different technologies uh the thing is is again repeating what's the value of that technology that we can use and how that can impact different type of farmers um so i think i think that uh, and, the, and the second point is that I think that there is a bottleneck today on how to process all that this data that is being generated. So we, we have a lot of sensors, a lot of things measuring things, but we are short on people with capabilities of analyzing that data. And that data scientists, but not people like running the, the stats that we kind of learn in college. So to nowadays, I mean, and in fact, you, you already have options here at UNL that you can take advanced course on statistics and some machine learning approaches or some uh, specific, even though this, all the statistics uh, branches are, are evolving because the amount of data that we are generating uh, allow us to do uh, different analysis that we, we couldn't do before. And I think that's positive, uh, but also we need to be aware of that we need to have the correct human resources to analyze that data. Because if we get a lot of data and we keep using the same method that we used before, maybe you know, we are investing in technology that is, is we are not taking all the, the value out of there. So I think that, yeah, that data analysis is, is, is a key topic, I think, for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, we are already generating a lot of data, how we can process that to make a decision and how that decision is impacting our production system and how we can measure that. If we can you know, follow that path and, and and show to the farmer or an agronomist or whoever wants to make a decision that this tool is is really impacting their system, I think that at, at the end that will push adoption in all these technologies. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Data is definitely, you know, we have we have so much data and how we use that data and it's almost pointless data if we don't analyze it and use it, take it that next step farther and um, I think it's important to also help those farmers take their own data and, you know, learn how to analyze themselves to make decisions on their own. Um, so that's really important. Um, so what are some of the probably biggest challenges or um, problems that might be preventing growers to adopting these technologies? So what I think are the main uh, barriers for I would say adoption as the, to use the same term and that we mentioned before uh, because uh, yeah adoption one thing is to use the technology and the second is I would say to adopt the technology when you adopt the technologies uh, you're you're making sure that you you know why you're 
using that and, and you you can get a specific value out of there. So one of the main limitations is that sometimes they are not sure if that specific technology will have a positive impact. Uh, so they hear about the tools, somebody told them, there are not clear reports, and that's not the farmer fault. I mean, uh, uh, companies or researchers, sometimes we need to uh, clearly show uh, results. And if we did 10 experiments and we got response in seven, okay, that's that's the result. So I can point out some specific work that the, let's say the SENSE project was conducting the, in the at here at UNL in research um, throughout different years on, on different uh, strategies to manage nitrogen. They were showing that in more than 60%, I believe, of the cases, they could get the same yields in corn, uh, but applying uh, less nitrogen. So they were also being more efficient in terms of profits. So that that's a specific fact. Uh, so you, after many years of research, many farmers involved, different technologies, there was not only one tested, there were tested growers technology beside any other uh, technology that evolved like a, a remote sensing or something more advanced like a crop model. Uh, so I think uh, that project was very interesting to show a specific value of using that technology. And there is, no, not in all the case, you will get a positive response. We, of course, we have some situations, but in, in, in the general number, you are seeing that uh, we could uh, keep the same level of production in some cases uh, be more profitable but also being more efficient with that nitrogen that we're applying because we don't need to lose that. Uh, don't take it out of our minds that that nitrogen that is not being used in production is going somewhere else and is that's having a negative impact for the system. So the value of the technology, I think that sometimes uh, farmers or uh, agronomists, uh, there is a lack of uh, a broad spectrum of training courses uh, uh, that can show them like how to use different technologies. That can be two of the main uh, barriers for adoption. Uh, sometimes before or in other countries like in Latin America, sometimes the, the cost of the technology was mentioned as some barrier, but in this research that we did, the cost was not the main one. The main one was, at least in Latin America, the lack of knowledge if this technology will make a positive impact and if it was worth it, the investment. So let's say five or seven years ago, uh, the main barrier for adoption was the cost. So this is a new technology, it's too expensive. They don't even think about if it was useful or not. So that I think that was a, a, a change in what was happening with this technology. Yeah, I agree with you, Guillermo. And it's important to say, because like you said before, uh, there are a lot of variability, different fields, different weather. So it really depends if one tool pays off for a farmer, other two, no. So it's important to make that point there and see what works best depending on each farm and each farmer. And switching in little gears here, like, what are the most excited about moving forward with the Nebraska Research Network? Okay, yeah. <laughs> now, I, I, when I joined the team last year, I think, I, as I mentioned before in the inter interview, I found out very exciting that uh, the network is already established. Um, and I, I, I say this because um, when I was doing my PhD, we, we tried to get something similar to this. And at that point, we, we did have it in there. Uh, extension agents, but we're not focused on this type of on-farm research. And we started doing some there and uh, arriving to Lincoln to UNL and seeing that they have already a network established. Uh, they started, I think, in 1990s. I think in 2012 was ramping up with the official project, but uh, it's interesting. And, and one point that I want uh, to mention that we have a lot of technologies, but the approach of the on-farm research having farmers doing research in their own fields, uh, giving value to all the knowledge that they have, and then making these end of the season meetings where they are. Uh, and it's the first time that I see people excited of talking and trying to speak in, in, in an extension meeting. Usually I was not get used to farmers kind of stepping up and talking what they did in their fields and how they find them and then talking with within them. And I think was quite unique and, 
and as something that is is specifically or is particular for the on farm research. You don't see that in other extension meetings. Usually in the extension, you have the specialist that talks and you have some of the farmers that they want to uh, make questions, they do questions, they get all the what they want. But in this case, farmers, they tell what they experience. And I think that there's a lot of value on that. Um, so I will point out that that's something unique, yeah. Yeah, on-farm research network and Nebraska Extension in itself is just really unique and really awesome. And I know a lot of farmers are super grateful for that. So before we wrap it up, is there anything that we didn't ask? We have two more questions for you. But before we ask those, is there anything that we didn't ask or talk about today that you want to share with our listeners? Uh, no, I think we are, we are, we are working in, in many projects, as I mentioned before. I just mentioned some of them. Today, uh, I would like to invite everyone. Uh, we are participating during the summer in different events, and uh, we have in August uh, 4th, uh, the Scal Field Day. Uh, I think it's just a great opportunity to interact with the audience. So whoever is listening to us, just keep posted because uh, there will be, I think we put together a nice program with, with uh, nitrogen tools, uh, technology, cover crops, I think will be very in irrigation tools. I think it's a great opportunity to to interact and to see each other after this time of 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 pandemic. And also we are kind of the first week of of August, we are uh, we're organizing here at UNL the nitrogen use efficiency workshop. Uh, so any researcher, any agronomists and even farmers are welcome uh, to join. This is a free event where uh, it's been held for more than 20 years. It's an annual event that is is going around the Midwest universities. And basically the focus of the discussion is how we can improve nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, so we have a, a, a great set of speakers lined up and I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. And we're also having uh, students from different universities presenting the research uh, posters and we have a hackathon competition. So basically the what they will be the future agronomists, they will compete in between them and uh, to try to develop a tool in, in two weeks before the event uh, to see how they can improve natural use efficiency. So I think that's quite an interesting approach. And yeah, we'll have that event happening the first week of August. Great. Here at UNL, so. Yeah, no, great. Thanks for sharing that, Guillermo. And where can our <laughs> listeners go to learn more if they are interested on more of your work, for example, or if they have more questions about what you've been doing? Uh, yeah, I mean they can they can we have a a, a lab website that is at UNL. They can look for Puntel Lab. I think that you can share in the description of the, yeah. the, the links. Uh, I do have a Twitter account is at Guille Balboa. Uh, you can <laughs> put that there. Um, and also yeah, the, you can put my contact information and my email is gbalboa7 at unl.edu. Uh, yeah, whoever has a question about mm -hmm. what I talk or want to get involved in some of this. And research, we're happy to answer any question or to participate. So here on the Farm Bits podcast, our tradition is to um, ask for some words of wisdom or advice for our listeners. Um, and so today I'll ask you for that. And if they are wanting to get involved in extension or if they have questions or need advice about digital agriculture. So my piece of advice is that uh, keep enjoying what are, what are you doing. Uh, we are producing food. Uh, to feed people uh, and for me that's very important uh, so keep uh, I know that the yeah, situation in the war is is in the last years is not uh, the best and uh, it's, it's quite challenging uh, and I know that in these hard situations farmers were up and working and, and, and keep the system running and uh, I think this is one of the more the activities that never stopped and that can tell you the importance of, of, of farming uh, and getting involved with uh, UNL or any other uh, agent, extension agency uh, uh, to keep uh, improving their operations, not only to improve their profits, of course, that's what they are <laughs> doing farming for, but also yeah, okay, keeping an eye on those environmental things that are going on. And we are a part of a society and we know, uh, uh, I'm convinced that farmers are uh, take care of that. Uh, uh, some people, you know, uh, but I think that, yeah, um, be proud of, of being a farmer uh, and keep up the work and 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 we are welcome to to help you to to improve your systems and your and your production. So and I think that we have a lot of 
uh, tools to to get involved and interact. So yeah. Thank you very much to Guillermo for taking the time to join this episode of the Farm Bits podcast. It's really exciting to hear the efforts Nebraska Extension is contributing to digital technology as well as data collection and analysis in agriculture to help farmers make decisions. One of my favorite parts of this episode was hearing about the upcoming tools that will be available and are currently being tested to assist farmers in making nitrogen decisions, as well as learning about the importance of quantifying those technologies and those impacts on farms. Yeah, I agree with you, Taylor. I also think that was neat to hear about how different countries are working to adopt these technologies in order to improve the management as well as help the environment in shoes. I hope you enjoyed that episode and we look forward to sharing another digital egg story with you next week. Thank you for taking the time to join us today on the Farm Beats podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts to be informed about the latest content each week. We welcome your feedback, so if you have comments or questions for us, please reach out to us over email, on Twitter, or in the review section of your favorite podcast platform. Our contact information can be found in the show notes. We would like to thank Nebraska Extension for their support of this podcast and their commitment to providing high-quality informational material to members of the agricultural community in Nebraska and beyond. The opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on this podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the views of Nebraska Extension or the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We look forward to you joining us next week for another episode of Farm Beats.